Hello booktube, it's SI Time, and today we're taking our essay from Great Essays of All Nations, 229 essays from all periods and countries, uh, edited by F.H. Pritchard, published by George G. Harrop and Company Limited, originally published in 1929, June 1929, and my edition is a reprint from April 1932, there is the title page, and it's, it, despite it not being that thick, it is a thousand pages long, so there is indeed 221 or 29 essays. And today, I'm going to read an essay by an author I'm not that familiar with. Um, I kind of like his writing. Uh, however, it is, um, he's got short sentences, but then he's got some very long sentences, so they're a bit winding uh, around, and he's a bit purple in his prose, but I, I, I kind of like it. His name is H.M. Tomlinson, and Pritchard provides a little bio uh, for each um, author at the beginning, so I'll read that, and then we'll go into the essay. H.M. Tomlinson was born in 1873. He has written many essays picturing scenes at home and abroad, life in quiet homeland ports, adventures on the high seas, the stillness of the jungle, and the monotony of a great desert. He also writes with the knowledge that is born of a keen thirst for adventure. In 1909, for instance, he shipped as purser on the tramp steamer uh, Coppella with his wages, lawfully recorded at a shilling per month. The result is seen in the entrancing book The Sea and the Jungle. Other books of his include Old Junk, London River, Waiting for Daylight, Tide Marks, Under the Red Ensign, and Gift of Fortune. He has also written a novel entitled Galleon's Reach. The following essay is reprinted from Old Junk by permission of the author and Messrs. Jonathan Cape uh, Limited. The essay is entitled Bed Books and Nightlights. <clears throat> Excuse me. The rain flashed across the midnight window with a myriad feet. There was a groan in the outer darkness, the voice of all nameless dreads. The nervous candle flame shuddered by my bedside. The groaning rose to a shriek, and the little flame jumped in a panic and nearly left its white column. Out of the corners of the room swarmed the released shadows. Black specters danced in ecstasy over my bed. I love fresh air, but I cannot allow it to slay the shining and delicate body of my little friend, the candle flame. The comrade who ventures with me into the solitudes beyond midnight. I shut the window. They talk of the candle power of the electric bulb. What do they mean? It cannot have the faintest glimmer of the real power of my candle. It would be as right to express, in the same inverted and foolish comparison, the worth of those delicate sisters, the Pleiades. That pinch of stardust, the Pleiades exquisitely remote in deepest night, in the profound where light all but fails, has not the power of the sulfur match, yet still apprehensive to the mind through tremulous on the limit of vision. Uh, and sometimes even vanishing, it brings into distinction those distant and difficult hints, hidden far beyond our verified thoughts, which are rarely properly view, which we rarely properly view. I should like to know of any great arc lamp which could do that. So the starlight candle for me. No other light follows so intimately an author's most ghostly suggestion. We sit, the candle and I. In the midst of the shades we are conquering, and sometimes look up from the lucent page to contemplate the dark hosts of the enemy with a smile before they overwhelm us, as they will, of course. Like me, the candle is mortal. It will burn out. As the bed book itself should be a sort of night light to assist its illumination, coarse lamps are useless. They would douse the book. The light for such a book must accord with it. It must be, like the book, a limited, personal, mellow, and companionable glow. The solid, 
the solitary taper beside the only worshipper in the sanctuary. That is why nothing can compare with the intimacy intimacy of candlelight for bed for a bed book. It is a living heart, bright and warm in central light, burning for us alone, holding the gaunt and towering shadows at bay. There are monstrous specters there the monstrous monstrous specters stand in our midnight room. The advance guard of the darkness of the world, held off by our valiant little glim, but ready to flood instantly and founder us in original gloom. The wind groans without, ancient evils are at large and wandering in torment. The rain shrieks across the window. For a moment, for just a moment, the sentinel candle is shaken and burns blue with terror. The shadows leap out instantly. The little flame recovers and merely looks at its foe, the, uh, the darkness, and back to its own place goes the old enemy of light and man. The candle for me, tiny, mortal, warm, and brave, a golden lily on a silver stem. Almost any book does for a bed book, a woman once said to me. I nearly replied in a hurry that almost any woman would do for a wife, but that is not the way to bring people uh, to conviction of sin. Her idea was that the bed book is sophic, and for that reason the e even advocated the reading of political speeches. That would be a dissolute act. Certainly you would go to sleep, but in what a frame of mind. You would, you would enter into sleep with your eyes shut. It would be like dying, not only unshriven, but in the act of guilt. What book should it be, uh, should it shine upon? Think of Plato, or Dante, or Tolstoy, or a blue book for such an occasion. I cannot. They will not do. They are not good to me. I am not writing about you. I know those men I have named are transcendent and greater lights, but I am bound to confess that times they bore me. Though their feet are clay and on earth, just as ours, their stellar brows are sometimes dim in remote clouds. For my part, they are too big for bedfellows. I cannot see myself carrying my feeble and restricted glim, following in pajamas the statuesque figure of the Florentine, where it stalks aloof, aloof in its garb austere pity, the sonorous deeps of Hades. Hades, not for me, not after midnight. Let those go who like it. As for the Russian, vast and disquieting, I refuse to leave all, including the blankets and the pillow, to follow him into the gilded tranquil tranquility of the upper air, where even the colors are prismatic spikes of ice uh, to brood upon the erratic orbit of the poor mud ball below cold earth. I know it is my world also, but I cannot help that. It is too late after a busy day and at that hour to begin overtime on fashioning a new and better planet out of the cosmic dust. By breakfast, nothing useful would have been accomplished. We would all be there where we were the night before. The job is far too long once the pillow is nicely set. For the truth is that... Uh, no, the, let me start again there. For the truth is, there are times when we are too weary to remain attentive and thankful under the improving eye, kindly but severe, of the seers. There are times when we do not wish to be any better than we are. We do not wish to be elevated and approved. At midnight, away uh, with such books. As for literary pundits, the high priests of the temples of letters, it is interesting and helpful occasionally for an acolyte to swing with a good hard one with the incense burners and cut and run for, for a change to something outside the Rubik's. Midnight is the time one can recall with ribald delight the names of all the great works which every gentleman ought to have read, but uh, which some of us have not. For there is almost as uh, much clodded nonsense written about literature as there is about theology. There are few books which go with midnight solitude and candle. It is much easier to say what does not please us than uh, than, than what is exactly right. 
The book must be, anyhow, something benedictory by a shining fellow man. Cleverness, cleverness would be repellent to such an hour. Cleverness, anyway, is the level of mediocrity today. We are all too inter infernally clever. The first witty and perverse paradox blows out the candle. Only the sick in mind crave cleverness as a morbid body turns to drink. The late candle uh, throws its beams a uh, great distance, and its rays make transparent much that seemed massy and important. The mind at rest beside that light when the house is asleep and the consequential affairs of the urgent world have diminished to their right proportions because we see them distantly, distantly from another and more tranquil place in the heavens where duty, honor, witty arguments, controversial logic, or great questions appear such as they have hardly a trace of fossil in the in indurated mud which presently will cover them. The mind then certainly smiles at cleverness. For though at an hour the body may be dog-tired, the mind is white and lucid, like that of a man from whom a fever has abated. It is bare of illusions. It has a sharp focus, small and star-like, as a clear and lonely flame left burning by the altar of a shrine from which all have gone but one. A book which approaches that light in the privacy of that place must come, as it were, with honest and open pages. I like Hind then, though. His mockery of the grave and great in those sentences which are as brave as penance in a breeze is comfortable and sedative. One's own secret and awkward convictions never expressed because not lawful and because it is hard to get words to bear them lightly seem them seem then to be heard aloud in the mild easy and confident diction of an immortal whose voice has the blitheness of one who has watched amused uh, amused and irreverent the high gods in an eager and secret debate on the best way to keep the guilt and trappings on the body of the evil they have created the first-rate explorer Gulliver is also fine. Is also fine in the light of an intimate candle. Have you ever lately uh, again? Have you read lately again the voyage to the uh, Hugh Hinnons? Hugh Hinnons uh, tried alone again in quiet. Swift knew all about our contemporary troubles. He has got it all down. Why was he called a misanthrope reading that last voyage of Gulliver in the select intimacy of midnight? I am forced to wonder, not at uh, Swift's hatred of mankind, not at the satire of his fellows, not at the strange and terrible nature of his genius, who thought that much of us, but how it, it is that after such a wise and sorrowful revealing of things we insist on doing, and our reasons for doing them, and what happens after we have done them, men do not change. It does seem impossible that society could remain unaltered after surprise its appearance, after the surprise its appearance should have caused it as it saw its face in the ruthless mirror. We point instead to the fact that Swift lost his mind in the end. Well, that is not a matter for surprise. Such books and France's Isle of Pigeons are not disturbing as bad books. They resolve one's agitated and outraged soul, relieving um, it with some free expansion, expression for the accusing and questioning thoughts engendered in the day's affairs. But they do not rest immediately to hand at the bookshelf by the bed. They depend on the kind of day one has had. Stern is closer. One would rather be transported as far as possible from all the, the disturbances of Earth's envelope of clouds, and Tristram Shandy is sure to be found in that in the sun. But best of all books for midnight are travel books. Once I was lost uh, every night for months with Dowdy in the Arabia Deserta, he is a craggy author, 
a long course of the ordinary facile stuff, such as one gets in the press every day thinking it is English, sends one thoughtless and headlong among the bitter herbs and stark boulders of Dottie's burning and uh, spacious expanse, only to get bewildered and the, the shin broken and a great fatigue at first in the strange land of fierce sun, hunger, glittering spar, ancient plutonic rock, and very Adam himself. But once you are acclimatized and know the language, it takes time. There is no more London after dark till a wanderer returned uh, from a forgotten land. You emerge from the interior of Arabia on a Red Sea coast again feeling as though you had lost touch with the world and used you used to know. And if that doesn't mean good writing, I know of no other test. Uh, because once there was a father whose habit it was to read uh, with his boys nightly some chapters of the Bible, and cordially they hated that habit uh, of his, I have that book too, though I fear I have it for no reason than he, the rigid old faithful, would be pleased to hear about. He thought of the future when he read the Bible. I read it for the past. The familiar names, the familiar rhythm of its words, its wonderful, well-remembered stories of things long past, like that of Esther, one of the best in English, the eloquent anger of the prophets for the people then who looked as though they were alive but were really dead at heart. All is solace and home to me, and now I think of it, it is our home and solace that we want in a bed book. So yeah, that ends uh, uh, H.M. Tomlinson's uh, Bed Books and Night Lights. And I, as I say, I kind of enjoyed that. It's a bit purpley, and it does, like he says too, it takes a while to get used to the language, because he does... He's got some really choppy sentences that move along, and then all of a sudden he gets this winding sentence that you got to make your way through, uh, which is it still works, but it takes a bit of time um, to to navigate. Um, I'm definitely going to look up more of his. Um, I don't know if uh, anything else has to do with books. Uh, it's only the one in here. Uh, but anyway, um, I will end it there. It's coming up to 18 minutes, and... Uh, oh, well, I'm just curious, what, 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 what do you uh, like reading at bedtime? Uh, to me, um, when I used to read in bed, it would be an essay. I, I loved reading essays, um, or a, short, a very short story, something that was quite short, that would take, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes to, to read. Um, what, oh, what, what do people like reading now? Do you like reading something that's heavy, uh, where he says it's sort of death to do that at nighttime? But anyway, uh, I'd love to hear. Take care, book two. Bye.